Hello and a very well, warm welcome to the third workshop, workshop on proximity perception in robotics towards multimodal cognition. Um, my name is Stefan mulbacher kara and I'm from Ionium Research Robotics in Austria. And on behalf of the entire organizing team, I would like to welcome you to the invited talk of Edward Cheng. I would like to hand over the word to Stefan Escalda Navarro from Ingeria, France, to introduce our invited speaker. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Uh, and um, thank you so much, Edward, for joining us in this workshop. Um, that Dr. Edward Chung started his undergrad studies in Worcester Polytechnic Institute in 1981. In 1985, he continued his studies at Yale, where he started collaborating with Professor Lemelski. During his PhD period at Yale, he worked on the development of a proximity skin for collision avoidance and teleoperation. After his PhD, he started working full-time at NASA, where he is still today. His work there notably includes servicing missioning, the servicing missions for the Hubble telescope. So uh, thank you again, Edward. Uh, this screen is yours to uh, start your talk. Okay. Uh, thank you for the invite, everyone. I am very honored and, and humbled by this uh, request. This is a thing that occurred uh, before some of you were born. So your interest in my really past work is, is wonderful and I, I thank you. All right, so let's get started in the early 80s with Vladimir Lumelsky and Alexander Stepanov's work. They did this at the General Electric Corporate Research Development Center in the state of New York. And their environment that they did their work in, in, this, in the area of motion planning was such that you was assumed, you were assumed to have complete knowledge of the environment. And this could happen with either a sensor system or, or some kind of CAD model. And then motion planning consisted of basically a, a brute force search. So uh, Lumeski and Stefanov wanted to do an opposite approach, and that is where they had almost no knowledge of the environment. And you, you might have a touch sensor, and, and you, but you certainly also knew where you were. Your coordinates were known to you. So using these principles, they developed some algorithms uh, where that, that, that ran on two dimensions on a plane of a an automaton, they called the bug. It would start from the S and arrive as the target or destination. And the algorithm simply involved moving along the ST line called the M line and moving until you hit an object and then you would follow it, do wall following until you hit the M line again and you repeat this process. And they were able to prove uh, that a path would be found if such existed. And so uh, with this work on, under his belt, uh, Vladimir moved to Yale in 1985, and he took on three students. The first was Kang Sun, and with Kang, with uh, Dr. Sun, uh, Lumelski extended this work to a three-dimensional body, a, a two degree of freedom robot arm, whose endpoint obviously exists on a sphere. And the planning occurred in what we at the time called configuration space, also known as image space. But we found out later it's more, other people call it joint space. So in this case, it's a two-dimensional uh, joint space or C space. And uh, because theta one wraps all the way around, it's, it's formed of a cylinder. So the planning would occur now on this surface and, and solve the problems with the arm. The second student he took on was Tim Spitz, and his work was quite different, and which is to show that although counterintuitive, a human being is really not great at planning the motion of an arm. You would think, we're all equipped with two of them, uh, and we use them all our lives. Surely we're great at this. Well, he, he set out to show with Skewers that this was not the case. And the way to do that was Tim 
developed this uh, computer game of sorts where you're briefly shown a task with the start position arm in white, and then you are required to put it in the target position. But after that brief glimpse, the whole environment will be blacked out. And as you touch something, you see just a momentary um, spot of where the touch occurred. And so with this kind of setup, uh, generally humans show to be very poor at doing this job. Uh, and for example, in this configuration space, you see the start here, the human operator is initially stuck in this space, then he's able to find his way around to this space, and then finally, again, finally uh, hit the target. So the path length in this particular subject was 79.95, 71.95, pardon me, and uh, quite long. And when you employ the automatic bug algorithm, it systematically finds the path and does so in, in less uh, path length. The third student he uh, recruited was myself. And my approach was different yet from the other two, which was to build hardware and actually put this on robot arms. Now, the first uh, iteration or attempt was a linear array. Here you see the, the array here. It had 16 pairs of sensors. Uh, the sensor pairs were embedded in a plastic uh, block to cause to make sure that they didn't uh, cross talk with each other. And then there was some simple optical filtering in terms of a red tape to cut down on ambient light. And this uh, modulated the sensors at the emitters at around 40 kilohertz so that we could coherently detect and, and ignore the effects of room lighting and, and window lighting and things like that. This was then placed on a Puma 560 that you see here. So as you can see, the perimeter of the arm is instrumented, including the tip, and the arm is restricted to motion in a plane. The, the obvious question now I had to solve was, how do we process these about 70 sensor pairs? Uh, the data collection is, occurs in Cartesian space, as you can tell. But our algorithms, our whole group's uh, method of solving problems was to map this to a point in a higher dimensional space or, or, or image space. So uh, we, we had to solve this problem, and I realized that our ma major task was to slide in Cartesian space. So that meant basically to, depending on the configuration that you're in, find the correct ratio of theta two and theta one, such that the endpoint arm moved along a line segment LM, which although you don't explicitly have the obstacle in joint space, it would mean you can slide along the obstacle in joint space. And of course, uh, this local tangent depends on the configuration of the arm, but I was able to derive a closed form solution so we could crank these up really quickly. Now in operation, each sensor that fires and sees something generates a local tangent. And in addition, there's a nuance here that the range detected caused a slight rotation of the local tangent to uh, cause you to servo and hover over the object in joint space. So these, these produce a quiver of arrows, if you would, and each arrow is rotated slightly left or right, clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on the range of that particular one. And then to move the next step, you choose the most conservative option, which is uh, if you're moving uh, clockwise around the object, you pick the leftmost tangent. Okay, so with that out of mind, uh, out of way, uh, we assembled the system and it proved to work quite well. I unfortunately don't have any videos of that, but uh, that was 2D. The next is to jump into three dimensions. So to cover the arm entirely rather than restrict the arm to a planar motion. And 
To do that, I employed a technology that was uh, I observed in available, which is flexible circuit boards. The uh, flexible circuit board would function as physical support for the sensor pairs, and of course, be a great opportunity to provide actual electrical interconnection at the same time. Uh, a vendor for this was found in the yellow pages. So back then, before Google, you pulled up the phone book. That's what you did to find resources. They were based in Bridgeport, Connecticut, just down the road from New Haven. So this sensor skin, uh, we had six made, and the yield was very poor because you know this was about a meter and a half, and and some of these features were were very small, down to the millimeter. So that that ratio produced provide proved to be a challenge, as you can imagine, and I was afraid of that. The best one had to be patched a little bit, but provided the skin for the L2 or the forearm. <clears throat> and then um, we had two patches for the upper arm, and they were created by cutting out sections of the main, main skin. And that was, that was intended originally all along uh, so that the, the artwork was, had both um, really embedded into them. And the electronics, of course, to decode all these sensors was also on the same surface. The refresh rate is about 17 hertz, and the range was about 10 centimeters. Uh, here you see a close-up of the uh, forearm section. You can see the LEDs as little clear objects, and then the receivers really pin diodes as black, the inherent uh, black color because it, it uh, filters out visible light, but it is transparent to IR. Um, the LEDs were connected in series, as you'll see in a few minutes on the video. So it would uh, light up a ring of LEDs, and then the pin diodes in a row here were all connected together. And so this, to reduce the electronics, was scanned in the row column fashion. Each section of the arm had its own frequency so that they would be kind of blind to each other. And then the whole thing was uh, downlinked serially off the arm, you can see the serial link here. Um, let's see, any other? So uh, afterwards, after assembly, they were conformally coded because to protect from corrosion. And in practice, uh, what I would do is I would position the arm in a certain pose. I'll take a reading of all the sensors and consider that to be the zero reading. And so every time the arm had to be zeroed, uh, and then when in operation, anything beyond that would of course be considered an obstacle. So just like in 2D, each sensor hit produced a tangent. In this case, in three dimensions, each sensor hit produces a normal. And so you get this forest of arrows basically at the contact point and then depending on where you want to go, you could intersect these uh, planes with the, target, the, the plane you want to walk in, and that produces a direction of motion. So the next work, the next part of this work was a realization that, hey, this, this system would be great for teleoperation. So uh, I built this mini master that uh, kinematically represents the big arm. And as you, you can know where this is going, we have the big arm follow the little arm unless there's an object in the way, in which case it does something appropriate. And you'll see more in the video what I mean by that. And then uh, we would run this system, and this is a photograph of Vladimir in the, in the foreground here. Uh, incidentally, we realized that his black hair and, and, and would not be a great reflection. So 
he went home and got this white baseball cap. It says Scooby Doo on it, by the way, which I thought was pretty funny. Uh, and he wore a light colored shirt for this. And so with that completes the setup to be the guinea pig, I mean, uh, test target for our test. Um, so here you see me with the mini master and running the arm. And you'll see more of that in the video in a few minutes. So uh, that is teleoperation. And finally, uh, pinnacle, I suppose, of the work was a fully autonomous system, just like the bug did in two dimensions. Uh, we, we expanded that algorithm uh, to three dimensions. You can see here, here's a start. It, it takes the M line when it hits an object. It takes the intersection of the object and the M plane, a new concept. And if it hits joint limits, it follows the joint limits and the object all the way around until it leaves the joint limits, back onto the M plane and back onto the M line if it can and so forth and so forth. So at this point, I would like to transition to the video to provide some illustration. Uh, here is first a shot of the blank flexible circuit board on a table. And you can see on the far end, the cuts that were made to form a dome for the end point. And in the next scene, you see the circuit board that contains the main uh, decoder for the sensors. Here you see the arm in visible light. You can see the end point, that dome on the end point was a bit challenged to build. And uh, with uh, infrared sensitive camera, we are able to see the, how the flashing of the LEDs occurs. And then when you slow it down, you can see the polling nature, how it scans on the arm. The next spot I want to cue to is what I call the repeller, where it basically just sits there and then it moves in the direction of the local tangents. It's a good tool for me to check the local tangents and it'll just allow me to move this big 150 pound arm without even touching it. And if you had multiple objects, it will kind of just average it, everything out and bounce around between the objects. I'm gonna cue forward. Here you see uh, examples of two arm operation, various other experiments, experiments we did with the arm. The next section is on the mini master. We see uh, how it moves and that it's similar to the big arm. And in the next section, you see the teleoperation at work. I can be fairly careless with the master and the skin equipped robot arm is able to kind of slide in a non-contact fashion. a scene with Vladimir in the workspace. And I do this uh, motion where I try and bop him on the head. And of course the robot arm denies my attempts. And finally, we can show fully autonomous operation. 
uh, where it is told to move the endpoint of the arm into the donut shaped object. I am not at the controls. I stepped away and then it uh, moves around with him, not aware of the position of the arm or even uh, staying very still actually. And then the arm kind of slides and glides over him. And in this case, as I illustrated, it looks for the M line while sliding on them and then finds it and acquires the donut shaped object and glides around that. Okay, so I would like to uh, resume the presentation at this point. And uh, after my work at Yale, we, uh, I moved to NASA Goddard Space Flight Center specifically for space station robotics. And instead of working on a whole arm sensitive skin, uh, we worked on intelligent tools with sensors on them that could acquire a object, in this case, an ORU, an orbital replacement unit. And uh, this particular invention was from Goddard. It had uh, a quick connect mechanism and also blind mate connectors that would mate, provide power. We had four capacitive sensors here that would be called capacitive flectors. And with an algorithm behind them, we could search around, look for an object, uh, make sure it was perpendicular to it, kind of find features and then engage with the ORU. So I did that for a while. And then for a few years, worked on Hubble. I left the field of robotics completely. I did five Hubble missions, a very fun and rewarding time in my life. And then uh, our group, which of course is was focused on human servicing of a spacecraft, mainly Hubble Space Telescope, with the retirement of the shuttle, decided to, uh, NASA decided to reform the group as a satellite servicing group. And of course, this time using robots. And uh, so I went back to the field of robotics, basically. And for a few years did uh, experiments in satellite servicing. Now, in this case, we were testing technologies to do refueling of a geosynchronous satellite. And with refueling, you need all kinds of technologies for tools and handling of fuel hoses and things like that. And we built these experiments that flew on the space station and that are still on space station. And um, using space station robotic assets, mainly the big arm, the SSRMS, and then the two-armed Dexter, Special Purpose Dexter's Manipulator, SPDM. So we did a series of tests to prove out our tools, our procedures, our electronics, all that uh, to, to uh, do that work. And the next phase of that, or during that work, I forgot about this slide, I had a very rewarding experience of flying in zero gravity to test uh, the flexible fuel hose and how it moves in zero gravity. And then, so uh, from that, I am now at my current project called OSAM-1. OSAM, OSAM stands for On Orbit Servicing Assembly and Manufacturing Mission. Uh, this is the distinguishment from the project of OSAM, which is a bigger project within NASA for the general purpose of doing on-orbit assembly and servicing. This mission, OSAM-1, is the first of that project's uh, missions. Our launch is in 2025, and the high-level uh, uh, plan or the high-level operation is to fly up with our vehicle here shown on the left. It has two 
Seven Degree of Freedom robot arms that we built mostly in-house at Goddard. Electronics are built in-house. As a four degree of freedom in the factor, so a total of 11 motors for, per arm. We have also a suite of rendezvous and proximity operation sensors on board that were tested as one of the technologies we flew on space station. As I mentioned, I've been working on this series of missions, testing technologies on space station. And one of them was the RPO package. The whole uh, concept of op operations is to approach a client satellite, in this case, Landsat 9. Landsat 9 is nearing the end of its life. It's, it's actually been decommissioned and it's just been orbiting, waiting for us basically as a test bed. So we'll fly up to Landsat 9, use the RPO, the rendezvous and prox op sensors to acquire its orientation in case it's tumbling. If it's tumbling, we're going to have to chase it, which means flying around uh, in a very difficult maneuver because the center of motion will not be inside the spacecraft, so it's not just simply rotating. Uh, we will track Landsat 9, reach out with one of the arms, grab the Marmon ring. The Marmon ring is the ring that originally fastened the spacecraft to the launch vehicle. And it's the one rigid item that you can count on, on one of these highly mass optimized vehicles. You can't just grab anything on them. But the, the, the Marmon ring originally had to endure a lot of stress. So there was a very good load path of the satellite to it. So that's one thing we can count on. It, it's grabbed, it's pulled down on the birthing system that we have, and then the two vehicles are locked together. At that point, we perform several servicing operations, including refueling. Uh, fuel is a commodity that's added at the launch site because you don't want this caustic and dangerous substance in the factory. And as a result, fuel valves are fairly accessible as a routine uh, thing. They may be locked up and, 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 and covered with the uh, assumption that they would never be accessed in space. And that makes our job more challenging. But it's possible to do the job as we tested with our series of test missions on space station. In addition, uh, we will, and that takes care of the on-orbit servicing part of our name. But we have a second payload back here called SPIDER, which will be doing the assembly and manufacturing. SPIDER itself is a third robot arm. It will do assembly of a large a reflector array. And that will be assembled in space and we form a, a reflector in the back here. Then we will attempt to communicate to the ground with this reflector to show that we were successfully built the reflector. And then finally, manufacturing. There's actually gonna be a uh, extrusion system here that will extrude and manufacture a beam in space. And this beam will then be extended out and the robot arm will detach from it and actually wave it around in space to show how stiff it is and, and, and perform tests on it. So that's where we are with the present. Uh, I hand the presentation back to you, Stefan, and thank you again for the invitation. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Edward, for this great, great talk. It's uh, inspirational, I think. Um, yeah, uh, we would like to have a small discussion, I think. So if anybody has questions, uh, please let me know. Um, Actually, if I may allow myself, I will ask a first question. Uh, it's about the collision avoidance approach. Um, so back in the in the 80s and 90s, uh, for me, there was two main approaches uh, surrounding proximity sensing. Uh, your approach with uh, Lumensky and the other one was for differential kinematics approach, which um, 
And the differential kinematics approach allows the, let's say, more or less easy handling of redundancy of the degrees of freedom of the robot. And also to use the redundancy, for instance, to gain uh, advantageous configurations. Uh, how easy would it have been to extend this approach you pursued to, to profit from uh, redundant kinematics? Oh, good question. I think it's important to um, uh, realize that this, this um, processing of sensor data is a two-step approach. Uh, the, the sensor data gathered in Cartesian space, three-dimensional space, uh, you decide on what it takes to move around locally while maintaining contact. And that means sliding. And so going into joint space, you have to decide, okay, uh, what is the, given the geometry of the contact, what is the uh, collection of joints I have to uh, do? What's the linear combination of joints in order to slide? Now, my robotics is very rusty, so pardon me about that. <laughs> But yeah. I believe you can map velocities in Cartesian space to velocities in joint space with the Jacobian. Yes. And so you can tell by the geometry, I, my sensor is now pointed in XYZ this direction. And I want this point of the arm to move in a, a motion perpendicular to it. And that will then produce the linear combination of joint angles that you need. I hope that's correct and clear. Uh, yes, I'm, I, honestly, I have a little bit of uh, difficulties visualizing, but uh, uh, I think we uh, we'll, can go into the next question. And uh, along the conversation, maybe we, we, can, we will retouch on the subject. OK. Um, uh, no more questions, Yital? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um... Of course, I have some questions. Um, first of all, thank you for, for the great talk. Um, I think I speak for all the organizers that um, your work is um, was one of the inspirations, I think, for, for all of us. Um, thank you. I want to ask, so with today's manufacturing uh, technologies, for example, 3D printing or the sending technology itself or mi microprocessors, um, how would you change your proximity sending skin since we are all the organizers were working on proximity sending skins, I think. Um, I think it would be interesting for us how you would change your design according to today's technology. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I recall or I, my feeling back then was our our sensor skin is pretty limited because we had to use reflective objects, white, white enough. And I was not very happy about that. But Lumelsky back then said, you know, you got to focus on one thing and solve this problem and and don't don't uh, have the sensor technology stop you. And then I left the field and I I I still think that you're still bound by basic physics and what you can reflect and that hasn't changed very much. I do note, however, that there is a lot of work recently being done in the super high frequency microwave region for cars these days. And I, I don't know how that interacts with objects because that's just a frequency I've never dealt with intuitively on a day-to-day on -day basis or even research-wise. So if I were to do this work nowadays, I would really look into that and try and leverage what they've done in the automotive industry in terms of bumper sensors and forward-facing radar and things like that. Maybe, uh, Hubert, can you comment on that? I know uh, Hubert is uh, working also on radar, so um, maybe you can Give us some more insight. Oh. 
Hmm. Okay, I think he's uh, he might not be. Ah, there he is. I'm not sure if the audio works well now. Uh -huh. Can you hear me? We hear you. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, of course, this is actually one of the ideas that are, are ongoing work to use here, the microwave radar uh, signals uh, for the proximity sensing part. Uh, at some point also we have uh, maybe even similar issues that some objects are not that reflective as, as, as others. Uh, but yeah, it's just something uh, that is indeed an, an interesting approach nowadays. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Robert. Oh, uh, Björn, I think, wants to uh, pose a question. Go ahead, Björn. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, again, also thank for myself. Thank you for this great talk. I, I have, I have a question basically about your current work, and uh, so um, you have uh, also the problem of um, somehow you have to reach the satellite, and you will be in cl uh, close proximity. So, what kind of sensors will you now use in your setup um, oh. uh, to to get this working? Yes, our um, our main sensors are from long range infrared visible, uh, I'm sorry, infrared cameras. So infrared imaging is our long range sensor. So we've broken into uh, three ranges for, for uh, approach. So long range is a simple infrared camera that looks for the target satellite as a bright spot. And that's it, that's all you see, single dot. As you're getting closer, uh, we, are gonna, we are gonna employ stereo cameras and we are going to use computationally heavy uh, proximity ops algorithms that use two cameras and then image recognition to find the pose of an object. So uh, we would have a model of the satellite and then we would use this camera system to have a, a search algorithm that's on board and will be doing the pose estimation. And this was something that we flew or are flying on space station. Every time that space station has a visitor in these days, and that could be you know, Russian, Japanese, Europeans, and now Americans, we have a camera system is hung underneath space station on the Zenith side, so the side facing Earth. And as the vehicle approaches, we do testing on it to verify that our RPO algorithms is able to do the pose estimation. So that's not my field, that's a separate field and uh, it's very computationally heavy, but uh, that system is what we use to acquire and get the range and get the pose, which is of course the most important part to get the pose and then uh, be able to uh, orient yourself to it. But then beyond that, there's no further system that uh, would engage if you have any occlusions or something. So there's no close proximity uh, sensing involved. Oh, good point. You are right. You're right. We do not at this point have an actual proximity system. Uh, well, I I'm sorry. I, I meant to say in the sense that I built. <laughs> yeah. What we do have closer in is LIDAR. So we paint the whole vehicle with LIDAR. And with that, we can um, find features even better than with vision. Uh, but in the gripper itself, for example, we don't have a proximity sensor. Uh, that was something that we researched, but uh, it was not something that we found reliable enough to integrate into our system. Um, I actually have another question that interests me. Uh, to understand a little bit the, the the context of the time where you were working on collision avoidance with proximity sensing, uh, do you feel like back in the day there was, um, let's say, a hype surrounding this subject? Um, because from the seeing from now and looking at the, the literature, it seems to be that back in the day there was a lot of approaches and a, a lot of technologies being looked at, but then. After the mid-90s, I think, 
the, the interest started to drop a little bit. And I was wondering if you have any insights on, on what, what happened. If it was a limit on the technology or... Um, yeah. yeah, that's a very interesting observation. And frankly, that's something that uh, your question is more benefiting me as information because I have frankly been a bit out of touch with this research. Um, also a little bit out of touch personally with Vladimir, which uh, he has now retired. Um, so I don't know what really happened with the field. Uh, so I, I unfortunately can't answer your question. I think it's a bit intriguing to hear that there was a little bit of waning of that kind of work. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I, well, it's uh, so just, uh, let's say, some, some observations. I think nowadays, as a community, I think the, the idea is to work towards um, cognitive robotics, that is to use machine learning methods uh, to, 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 for control and for autonomous robots in the sense of um, um, grasping and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I, at, in, some, in some way, I feel that the concepts of used in collision avoidance, they were established, but uh, for now at least, there's not so many improvements that can be done upon them. Uh, but maybe uh, you, tell, you tell you have a, also some idea. Well, I think um, the proximity sending um, delivers different kind of data that we usually see with RGBD data. And I think the collision avoidance that we developed for RGBD data or LIDAR data um, should be uh, is used, can be used for proximity sensors, but um, it should be unpassen, um, um, uh, adapted. Adapted, yeah, it should be somehow adapted to proximity sensing with uh, its different kind of properties. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, if there's one more question, I think we can we can take one more question. Um, well, uh, if it's not the case, um, I would really uh, thank you uh, again, Edward, for for your time, for giving the talk, and for uh, for this discussion. Um, yes, and uh, I, I hope to see you in the in the panel discussion we will have uh, on the twenty eighth of October. Uh, I think it